So this is Sarah Smith. I just saw some people, um, a person raise their hand. If you have questions um, or comments, you can use the the chat or the uh, Q and A. So Steve uh, Rice from Alaska, I just got your message that you're driving through remote, remote Alaska and you can re-log on as many times as you like. It looks like we're going to have a nice uh, representation from Alaska today, so we're glad to have you. If somebody would like to type a question in our question and answer section right quick, that would be great. Then we'll just know that that's working because that's how Paul's going to answer his questions during the video today. So, Paul, can you see the questions? Yeah. Okay, now I see. I can see how you can answer them. Yep. And um, once, uh, if you ask a question, once they're asked, they will be answered and you will all be able to see them in the live. Actually, I might just, I'm going to make it so everybody can see the questions all, um, uh, uh, can see those. So it's two o'clock and um, in effort to make sure we maximize our time, I want to welcome you guys to our second In the Swine Barn series with WSU and SDSU. I know everybody out west here knows the WSU is Washington State University, not the University of Wyoming. Uh, WSU or Wisconsin, but South Dakota State University um, has uh, partnered with us on these webinar series. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Samuel. Um, he's a swine specialist at South Dakota State and he's partnering with us to bring these programs to us. And um, at the end, Dr. Samuel, I'll have you introduce at, uh, as we wrap up what our March uh, seminar will be. Does that sound good? Very good, will do. Sounds great. We also have on uh, Mr. Ernie Barnes from the National Pork Board. He is producer relations, director of producer relations. We greatly appreciate the support of the National Pork Board. Not only do they help with the checkoff funding to help bring this uh, available to us, but they provide us a lot of great resources and actually were the ones that partnered Washington State University and South Dakota State up together to do this. So today we're going to be in the freezer. As you can see, the uh, carcasses behind me, there might be a little virtual reality happening there. Um, Paul and I went uh, and did these carcasses a couple weeks ago. So we'll have a video that we'll be sh um, showing um, and I'll let Paul talk about that. But first of all, I wanna say, if you have any questions, 
please put those in the question and answer. Um, Paul will be watching that uh, section and be answering them as we go. We should have about 10 minutes at the end for you guys to ask additional questions. Um, but by all means, uh, put your questions out there and we'll make sure that everybody can see those. Um, We'll just roll roll the, the presentation like that. If you have questions about uh, the format, if something's going wrong with Zoom, you can go ahead and put those in the chat section and Ryan and I will watch for those to answer those questions. Uh, at the end, there will be a survey that you guys will get when you click out. You guys did a great job answering those last time. So that helps us greatly in developing uh, our programs. We're pretty excited about the, the next program that we'll be bringing. Uh, we'll be bringing these to you once a month. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Paul Cooper, who's gonna be our featured speaker today. And he is going to introduce what we're gonna be talking about. Wanna take it away, Dr. Cooper? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, hopefully, uh, we can get through this. I think it'll be a good good presentation. You guys will enjoy it. Um, the video is actually going to uh, show some live video footage, and we'll be working our way back to uh, the retail cuts, uh, through the wholesale and retail cuts. And so if you guys have questions as we go through this, certainly pop those into the chat box. Um, I think uh, if it's a pretty comprehensive video. Obviously, it doesn't give us every possible thing that we can get out of a pork market, but it gives us some of the basic cuts there. So, Sarah? Thank you, Paul. So, I will go ahead and start this. And, like I said, everybody just go ahead and ask your questions and we'll keep answering them as we go. It's a pretty in depth uh, video that we do from pig to pork chop. Welcome to Washington State University Extension and the Department of Animal Sciences educational video from pig to pork chop, which will outline how much meat you can expect from a butcher hog. There are many things to consider. Whether you are a meat consumer considering purchasing a live pig that will be butchered for home use, or a pig producer wanting to sell animals directly to consumers for home meat consumption, this video will provide information about pork meat quality and quantity when purchasing or selling a pig for harvest for consumption. We will be evaluating three different types of market hogs, from live evaluations through carcass fabrication to evaluate meat quality and factors influencing the pounds of meat you would get from a butcher hog. The first pig we're going to evaluate live is a 275 pound white crossbred barrel or castrated male. This pig is typical of pigs raised by commercial producers that are selected because of their fast growth, efficient conversion of feed into pounds of pork, and acceptable meat quality. These pigs are not extreme in any one trait. However, they are typically long-bodied with adequate muscle need for a good yield of retail meat cuts. The second pig is a 260-pound hamp cross pig that was raised for youth exhibition by 4-H or FFA youth. Show pigs are typically selected for their physical appearance. A good show pig has more muscle shape and definition than our typical commercial pigs. Today's show pigs are appreciated for their depth of body and usually have adequate back fat needed for quality bacon and a good eating experience. The third pig that we're going to evaluate is a heritage breed hog called Large Black. This is a barrel weighing 315 pounds just prior to butcher. Heritage breed pigs are increasing in production and demand to meet niche markets that are requesting forage raised pork with increased marbling, increased tenderness, and flavor. Heritage breed pigs are typically lighter muscled and will accumulate more fat resulting in a lower percentage of total product. But what they lack in quantity, they make up in quality. Well, at this uh, point in time, we're gonna go ahead and evaluate the carcasses from the three live hogs that you saw a few minutes ago. Um, when we evaluate animals uh, on the hoof and we evaluate them on the rail, we look for some very similar things. Uh, muscle is very important. Fat cover is very important. And then the one uh, thing that we really have a hard time getting a, uh, a handle on is that, that of the quality piece until we actually break those carcasses open. And so we have three pork carcasses that again you saw live. 
Uh, we've got uh, number one over here, which is a relatively lean and heavy muscled hog. A nice shape to that, uh, that loin eye there. And we've got uh, a hog that uh, certainly has uh, a, a, a fairly nice or a fairly uniform or average uh, type color. The hog uh, number two here, which is um, a Hampshire hog. This is a typical commercial hog. This was actually a hog that was raised for the purpose of uh, exhibition or show. Uh, we've got a Hampshire hog. He's relatively uh, heavy muscled as well. A little bit more compact in his design. We tend to go for a little shorter bodied, more muscular type hogs in the show industry than we do the commercial industry. A nice cushion up here, a nice shape uh, to that ham sirloin junction. And uh, again, a hog that uh, I think is uh, acceptable in terms of fat, maybe a little bit fatter than what our commercial hog is. I've got the actual data and we'll talk about that here in a second. And then our third hog, um, which is uh, kind of fits into the niche marketing aspect, uh, one of the heritage breeds that we're starting to see on the rise here in the United States, which is a large black, I think a hog that's got some uh, uh, dimension to him, not maybe as much muscle expression as what we see in those two hogs there. And so we start to see a little bit less shape up here in the ham. I think he's pretty good in the cushion, about average, but I think he really starts to lose and he's a little bit more deficient in terms of that muscle shape when we get into that hip, hip area. But one of the things that these heritage breeds tend to excel on is color. They tend to be a little bit darker in their color and they tend to be a little bit more uh, higher in terms of marbling as well. And so we'll evaluate that here in a second. We start to look at uh, color aspects. Um, this is the uh, North American uh, Meat Processors Association uh, uh, Meat Purchase Specifications Handbook. And they've actually got uh, pork uh, quality uh, page here in this book that talks about uh, color, texture, and exudation. So one of the things that we have an issue with in the pork industry is pale, soft, and exudative pork. Um, I think all of these hogs here are acceptable in terms of that piece. Uh, we've got a color standard, and we've got a marbling standard. And so those three things are the things that we want to evaluate. What you'll notice is on this hog, he does show me a little bit of exudation there, but I think he's pretty firm across the cut surface and he's a little bit darker in color uh, than what you would normally see in a pale soft and exudative hog. And uh, we've got the data uh, listed uh, on the screen for you. We start to evaluate this hog here in terms of color and texture. And again, I think a very acceptable type hog a little bit of purge there since we just ribbed these carcasses. Uh, that's pretty standard, you will see that uh, in the industry, but again, I think color is very acceptable and texture is very acceptable as well. We start to evaluate that. And then we look at this hog here, we've got another hog, again, a little bit darker in color, not quite as large in terms of that ribeye, so again, that kind of matches up with muscling and conformation. We've got about average ribeye size on these two hogs here in the center. In fact, uh, that first hog is at about a, uh, a 7.4 in terms of a ribeye, a 6.25 on this hog here. So a little bit smaller, but still very acceptable. Nice oval shape there. And then this hog here, um, a lot lighter muscled at about 3.8 inches. Uh, but again, typically people that are pr producing these type of hogs and consuming these type of hogs are looking for two specific things, marbling and color. And uh, that's one thing that this, would this hog would probably have an advantage of. Marbling here on this hog, certainly um, at an acceptable level with a 2.0, a 2.0 over on this hog, and a 3.0 on this hog as well. So when you start to evaluate that cut surface, you can see the marbling flex there. So just to reiterate, a lighter muscled hog, but a darker colored lean, and a higher quality marbling. These two hogs here, very similar in terms of their color, a little bit more muscle in this hog when we start to evaluate ribeye size, because he's got a larger ribeye, and he's also a little bit leaner, so he's gonna be a relatively high yielding hog or high yielding carcass. This hog here, 
a very nice muscle shape, a little bit shorter body, not quite as large in terms of that ribeye area and a little bit more fat cover. So probably a notch lower yielding to, than that carcass. But again, both of these two carcasses, very industry acceptable. Uh, this carcass is gonna fit into those niche markets, uh, small farm uh, type production. One of the things that we do in the lab to evaluate color, and this actually discerns a, a larger difference. But when we start to evaluate um, color from the naked eye, we can see some variations. This hog here certainly has that darker colored lean compared to this hog here. It's maybe a minute difference, but when you evaluate it with a, a, a color meter, this is a Hunter Lab color meter, it measures lightness to darkness. It measures uh, um, the A value as well as the B value. So the red, uh, red green spectrum and then the blue yellow spectrum. And uh, when we start to evaluate this, this hog is significantly darker in color, which is what we expected to see, but we've got data to prove that. These two hogs here are very similar. They're much lighter in their color. They're still in an acceptable range, um, but much lighter in color. If we evaluate for back fat thickness, we've got almost two inches of back fat between the 10th and 11th rib. That's where we would actually measure it for certain specifications. We start to evaluate back fat at the last rib. Again, we're over two inches of back fat. On this carcass here, we're just under an inch, just under an inch. And this carcass here, we're about uh, seven tenths, so even leaner, but still acceptable. The questionable thing would be is when we break these carcasses down, will we have enough belly thickness in what we call the pocket region that will allow us to actually have um, a thick enough belly. It's a quality issue that we have in the pork industry. We start to evaluate hog carcasses and we look for um, uh, uh, lean carcasses, heavy muscle carcasses. We've gotten to a point where we've actually had a decrease in belly quality or belly thickness. And that creates problems for bacon. Bacon's a really hot commodity on the retail market. And so we wanna make sure that if we do have hogs that are lean, heavy muscled, that they still have enough thickness and dimension in their bellies so that we can capitalize on that portion of the market. In this segment, uh, we'll be working on uh, one of the pork carcasses that we saw in the last segment uh, with a video of the live uh, animals as well as the carcass demonstration uh, from a quality perspective. Uh, this was the uh, number one hog, which was our heaviest muscle and our leanest hog. So again, a tremendous amount of muscle shape in that shoulder, a, a nice ham to this hog, um, and a nice uh, a long body or extended body here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and break this carcass down into uh, the four primals. And uh, primals are kind of like the first cut that we pull out of a carcass. And so we've got the shoulder region, which will be broken into two cuts, the Boston butt, which is the upper portion of the shoulder, and then the picnic shoulder, which is the lower portion. Uh, we'll show you where that cut is gonna be made here in a second as we break it away from the rest of the, uh, the whole cell cuts. Another whole cell cut is the full loin. Um, in other species, it typically is a rib section and a loin section, but in the pork carcass, we consider this whole thing to be loin, which includes the ribs as well as the, the loin proper in that lumbar region of the carcass. And then we'll be taking off the belly, which will be cured for, uh, for bacon. And again, we'll wanna make sure that the belly thickness is acceptable so that we have a high quality uh, end product. And then we will pull off the, uh, the ham section or the fresh leg. And uh, again, that will go through a curing process and so we'll prepare that uh, uh, for that process. The idea is to be able to show you the basic carcass breakdown uh, we will show you some uh, retail cuts as well as we continue through this segment. So our first uh, uh, process is to go ahead, working with Dan here at Washington State University. We'll be breaking down uh, this carcass between the second and third rib. 
You want to flip that over? So again, as we go through this carcass breakdown, this is pretty standard. When we start to evaluate um, carcasses, go ahead, Dan. We start to evaluate carcasses, again, there's the, uh, the Institute uh, for the Meat Buyer's Guide from the uh, North American Meat Institute, which also gives us the specifications, most industry, uh, um, or most industry processors go by these specifications. So between the second and third rib, we'll separate that shoulder. The next cut that Dan is going to do is looking at the location of the blade bone and about one inch or a half inch down from that blade bone. He'll actually make a cut that separates the picnic shoulder from the Boston butt. Okay, we'll go ahead, uh, um, should we clean this up before we get a weight or? Yeah, we can. Pull those riblets off and that sternum. Okay, and a portion of the jowl there. Okay, and we can grab a weight on that jowl as well as and then should we pull the, uh, yeah, the neck bones. So Dan's pulling out the neck bones and uh, the feather bones that are uh, left there where we split that carcass down. And again, gonna clean that up just a little bit. In a retail setting, if you're looking for a large roast, um, these are two options, particularly if you've got a big event coming up, it's relatively inexpensive uh, to be able to purchase these two items. You throw these into a slow cooker or some type of a, 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 a slow food environment uh, of cooking and, and certainly have a, a real popular product to be able to share. We'll grab a weight on these two cuts. Um, before we do that, we'll go ahead and break down uh, the, uh, separate the loin ham junction. At this point, Dan's separating the uh, loin ham junction. That saw is about one inch from the H bone. So this would be the H bone or where we actually split that, uh, um, uh, that carcass in half or that hip bone. And uh, so we measure about one inch from that H bone and then we separate that ham off. Um, let's go ahead and pull off the... Should we clean this up? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, well, let's get a weight on that from a wholesale cut standpoint. Okay. Um, shall we get a cut from... Now Dan is separating off the belly from the loin. And again, we've got uh, about 11 ribs there. About an inch from the spinal column, he separates that off. With a straight cut. And again, that separation 
here is about uh, right uh, parallel with the tenderloin. The tenderloin muscle sits right up underneath this cavity. So on top, you've got the lingismus dorsi muscle, which is your largest muscle. That's that big oval muscle that we took a measurement on earlier um, on the video. You'll see it again here in a second. Uh, well, actually, I can show you here where we separated the carcass. So that would be the lingismus dorsi muscle. And then the psoas major minor combination is this group here that rests right up underneath that top line. One thing you'll notice is that the reason that this portion of the carcass tends to be very tender in all species, um, you've got a muscle group that really on top has only one purpose and that's to keep that top line straight. Uh, you've got muscle groups in the forequarter and the hindquarter uh, that help to lift that hog up or that animal up, move that animal around, and then carry that animal's weight from the water trough to the feed bunk or out to the field and back again. They lay themselves down and then again they have to pick that weight up. Every time you do that, that takes structure, it takes scaffolding. And so what happens is those muscle groups tend to be tougher in these regions. How, how do we deal with some of the toughness? We cure that product, we slow cook that product, we have applications in terms of preparation that help us to, to get it to a point where it's consumable. These cuts are a lot less forgiving, or a lot more forgiving, excuse me. Um, and what I mean by that is we can actually put these through direct heat application when we pull cuts out of this midsection because of their point of attachment. This just has some muscle structure to keep that top line up. But then when we look at the tenderloin in the beef carcass, that would be transferred into filet mignon steak, um, or Chateaubriand would be another type of application. In those muscle groups, this only has one point of attachment. That's at the butt end. It doesn't attach at this fore end, so there really is no structure, there really is no purpose of this muscle other than it gives us a great eating quality. So here we have the, uh, the loin, the belly, which will get weights on all of these cuts, the ham, and then our shoulder with our Boston butt and our picnic shoulder. So as we mentioned, uh, we saw the entire carcass uh, broken down into whole cell cuts, and now we're gonna further process those cuts uh, into some typical uh, consumer products. The shoulder was broken down into the Boston butt, which was the upper portion of that shoulder. The lower portion was the picnic. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna do is um, we're gonna have Dan pull the skin off of this carcass, or off of this uh, Boston butt uh, cut. And, uh, and then we're going to pull off two blade steaks from that cut, which are two uh, consumer products that you might see in the retail case. The balance of that Boston butt, again, can be used uh, somewhere in a slow foods environment, uh, slow cook, high heat, moisture that, that would actually break apart uh, the connective tissue and uh, uh, produce a very tender uh, consumer desirable product there. So the first thing we'll do, and we've already done this, uh, as you'll see with this carcass, it was all skin on, so it went through a scalding tank. Um, some of the product, we're gonna go ahead and leave the skin on, uh, or a portion of that, but with this Boston butt, we're gonna go ahead and pull that entire cap off, and so Dan will demonstrate that now. Some of the key things uh, to remember when you're breaking down carcasses or even if you're doing some, some uh, meat uh, fabrication at home, uh, a sharp knife is really your best friend. Uh, trying to do this with a dull knife or dull tools uh, just is gonna create an opportunity for injury and that's certainly not something that we wanna do. So uh, if you know how to sharpen knives, that's fantastic. If you don't, then look for a commercial uh, uh, person to be able to get that done for you. So here we have the, uh, the skin off. Um, that, those type of products certainly could be used. Um, many of you may have heard of chicharrones, which are a very crunchy snack uh, from the Hispanic culture. And so uh, that's certainly something that you could further process if you chose to 
uh, or if you had to remove that at home and, and you had a deep fat fryer. So we'll go ahead and uh, pull this uh, Boston butt now and uh, we'll grab the, uh, the blade steaks. The difference between a steak and a chop on a pork carcass, steaks come out of that forequarter or the hindquarter, anything out of the loin is considered to be a chop. So here we have uh, some blade steaks. Um, this is a, a bone dust scraper, so we're gonna go ahead and just pull that across the top to kind of clean this product up. We're gonna trim this to about a quarter inch all the way around. I will say that uh, pork fat is a very palatable fat. It's one that tends to stay more liquefied during the consumption process more so than the other species. Pork fat is uh, rated as, as the most palatable of uh, the hoofed species. And so certainly uh, something that a lot of people desire as a component of their consumption. And again, steaks come out of uh, the shoulder. They also come out of uh, uh, the ham region or the leg region. Anything out of the middle section of that carcass will be considered to be a chop. And the last component that we have is the, uh, the balance of that Boston butt. So again, that's a nice size roast if you're looking for a family event. There's quite a bit of product in there. Again, leaving a little bit of fat cap or fat cover on that product so that you can get um, uh, some of that flavor. It's gonna help base the meat during that cooking process. Okay, and last but not least is to uh, clean up and prepare this picnic. So what we've already done is we've separated that bone off so we have a nice clean cut on that shank region. Very similar to what we'll be doing on the ham is about uh, three to four inches in. We're gonna go ahead and clean up what we call is the collar. That would be a, uh, a picnic shoulder, uh, again, for a slow cook environment. Okay, we've moved uh, to the, uh, the belly uh, as far as our whole, next wholesale cut region that we're gonna be working on. And in the belly, we're gonna actually obtain uh, one retail cut um, that uh, comes out straight away as a fresh product, and that will be the pork spare ribs. Uh, so that's the lower portion of that rib section. If we're doing back ribs, we would pull those out of the loin region. But uh, in this belly region, we consider those or, or term them as spare ribs. Um, the uh, one thing I wanted to point out, and I talked a little bit about this during the carcass demonstration segment, 
but we talk about lean hogs and trying to reach uh, the belly depth that is appropriate or will give us the highest quality return uh, in terms of bacon. And so if we look at this region here, this is what we call the pocket. And in this area, we need to look for about a half inch minimum thickness or depth. And on this belly, I think we've hit that half inch minimum. Anything more than that will actually give us a thicker and more robust bacon slice. And so that's what we're looking for. Uh, so this bacon or this belly will certainly meet the qualifications there. Dan has already taken the opportunity to uh, square this up so it's a true rectangular form. One thing you'll also notice is that the belly still has skin on. You can order belly skin off or skin on. In the case of a skin on belly, a lot of times processors will take this through the cure process before they remove that skin just prior to slicing. Um, it's a, a pretty tough beast to remove, but uh, uh, certainly uh, something that uh, a, lot of, a lot of consumers may not like in their bacon as an end product. So we'll have Dan go ahead and remove the spare ribs. Once the uh, spare rib section, as you can see, is sticking pretty close to the ribs there, once the spare rib section is removed, then um, what he'll do is he'll clean up that belly. It'll be ready for either a dry cure or a brine injected type cure where we actually mix a saline solution, uh, usually with nitrate and phosphates um, or maybe some other component that's a natural nitrate component that will incorporate uh, the cure process into that. Um, so that belly is really ready for the cure process now and then the smoking and cooking process. Um, should we go ahead and maybe clean these up a little bit? And... Okay, so through the natural cartilaginous attachment where, that, uh, where the ribs uh, attach to that breastplate or that breastbone, Dan just went ahead and took his knife and you can see he separated that. This is actually bone down here in the lower portion, but he pulled that off. He's cleaning off the, uh, um, the internal fat from that belly region. And now we've got a, a pretty nice product that we can go ahead and put into a uh, retail case. A lot of times they'll fold this over and uh, you might see this as a shorter section, but when you open that up, you've got a nice, uh, spare rib section there for a retail product. So we'll capture weight on these two before we move on to the next product. So our third major wholesale cut is the full loin out of the pork carcass, which includes the rib section, a few additional ribs in the loin, and this would be considered to be the center cut loin. So if you've seen retail uh, cuts in the pork case, you might see a center cut loin chop. So that's gonna be out of this region and then we'll have the sirloin chops or the sirloin region that's attached to the loin and uh, not the leg like we see in other species. So we're gonna go ahead and break this down. As you remember, or you may recall, we separated between the 10th and 11th rib on the loin. And that's where we took a measurement of the loin eye area. And this was our largest loin eye area, a little bit over seven inches, which is a, a decent sized loin and certainly make a nice presentation on the retail plate. Dan's already taken the uh, skin off. So we pull that off of the loin. And on this rib section, what we're going to do, since this is going to be a rib roast, we've got eight ribs. So again, we separated that shoulder off between the second and third rib. And then we separated the center cut loin off between the uh, 10th and 11th rib. We're gonna go ahead and trim this to a quarter of an inch, but just prior to doing that, Dan went ahead and separated off the uh, chine bone, which is the attachment to um, the rib to the backbone or the, or the spinal column. And uh, when you measure or you remove that chine bone where we have those vertebrae attached, now we've actually got it to uh, a point where it's chef ready, meaning that everything that can be done is with a knife. So we can separate between those rib bones. So a chef could actually, or a consumer, could roast this entire rib roast as a whole unit. 
You put it bone down, fat up, it's gonna baste the meat while it cooks, um, which is certainly gonna help out from the flavor standpoint. We pull that product out and we can actually, with a knife, slice through that entire product because there's no bone that's going to uh, uh, intervene there. So let's go ahead and trim this to a quarter of an inch. And really, uh, when we have a hog that's only six tenths of an inch of fat, there's not a lot of fat to trim. So this is uh, not gonna take us a tremendous amount of time here. So that could serve as a rib roast. One other application is to go ahead and uh, clean up this cap region of this muscle, pull out this uh, blade bone here. And there shouldn't be any more uh, um, bones or, or anything that you have to cut through along this process here. So everything that's going that's bone is a rib bone that's going this direction, all right? Um, so you could actually take a nice slice once you get that whole roast uh, completely cooked through. One thing uh, to make note of is that pork products, uh, as of about, uh, I think, 2012, they uh, went to a point where we could actually cook pork to a medium, re uh, uh, medium rare degree of doneness, which is 145 internal temperature. So if you're cooking your roast to a medium, degree, medium rare degree of doneness, what you should do is actually carry that product to about five to 10 degrees within your end point. So if it's 145, somewhere in that 135 to 145 range, and allow that product to rest for about a, a 15 to 30 minute period before you actually serve it. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and take the balance of this loin, and Dan's gonna go ahead and take one inch chops all the way along that, you'll be able to see the progression of the retail cuts. Okay, what we're doing now is we're trimming everything to a quarter inch. That could be a pretty standard specification. Sometimes you may have specifications that call for other trim. Okay, so we've got uh, the uh, full loin here now represented in, in one inch chops. And as we go through this process, uh, we've got the rib chops here. There's no presence of lingissimus dorsi muscle until you get to uh, this chop here, and you'll start to see some lingissimus dorsi, or uh, psoas major, psoas minor muscle, which is your tender, tenderloin muscle. So these chops all do have lingissimus dorsi on that top level. You get to the bottom of that, which this chop would be sitting in the back, 
you start to see your tenderloin muscle. This portion here, the tenderloin muscle starts to increase in size. So these would probably fall into the T-bone category. And then we start to see a more convex shape, which is going to give us a little bit larger, more robust tenderloin muscle. And so these would be considered to be porterhouse chops uh, from the uh, center cut uh, pork loin. We get to the uh, two last chops here. We actually debone those and we've got the, uh, the sirloin region which is going to give us our uh, pork cutlets. And we've got two of those off of this center cut loin. And for our uh, final uh, wholesale cut um, or primal is the, uh, the fresh pork leg. Um, uh, traditionally, a lot of people uh, uh, will move towards a cured product uh, with the fresh pork leg and do a ham. And so that's how we're going to prepare this product uh, so that it can eventually make it into the retail case. Uh, obviously, a ham this size is going to require a large family gathering or, or potentially some leftovers, but uh, uh, ham has a lot of uses and so we're fine with that. So the first thing that we're going to do um, is uh, let's talk about how we clean this product up. We took the hock off uh, or, the, or the hind leg off at the hock region and we clean that up with a straight cut. And then again, if you remember, we separated this from the loin about an inch from the H bone, which is the, uh, the hip bone that's split down the center of, uh, of the pork carcass. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and have Dan pull the collar off. And as he's doing that, I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about the, the importance or one of the reasons that sometimes we see ham products or the picnic shoulder, if you recall, where we leave a skin uh, portion on that. So Dan, if you wanna go ahead and start removing that. But as Dan's removing that, one of the reasons that we think about uh, fat distribution on a pork carcass, uh, fat on a pork carcass or, or a, a hog is gonna actually occur from the top down and from the front back. And so when we get to the picnic shoulder, when we left a portion of that skin on that shoulder, it was to protect the, uh, the product during the cooking process. And the same thing as we go to the ham, uh, we'll see a lot of people, particularly on leaner hogs, leave that skin on during the brine and the cooking process so that it protects some of the muscle tissue there so we don't have a lot of moisture loss. A lot of that will be cut off after the process is complete. Um, so that we, that we don't consume that. Um, but again, we pull that skin off. We've got a nice uh, uh, collar here um, that we're gonna go ahead and use for some fat. When we brine this product, there's two ways that we can do it. One is through, or three ways. One is through a single needle injection, which requires you to inject every so many inches or inch into that product, you'll put a, a portion of brine into that product. A multi-needle injection is just as I, as I mentioned. It's a process where you may have a machine or a handheld multi-needle that's gonna go in and inject in so many spaces, but that's gonna be a quicker process than a single needle. The third way is to actually use the vascular system, and what we do is we try and find the vein here we put the needle into that vein and we run that brine through that vascular system. Now all three of these processes require time to allow that muscle tissue to equilibrate. And when we do that, we get that brine evenly distributed throughout that product. So it might be when you brine one day or you inject and then you allow it to rest over a 24 hour period in a tub or a brine solution so that we'll equilibrate throughout that product before it goes into the smokehouse and finishes the cure product, um, the curing and then the smoking for a finished um, uh, ham versus a fresh leg. Now that we've processed the five uh, primal or wholesale regions of the pork carcass, uh, we have uh, the, array, the uh, array of cuts here on the table uh, in front of you. So we're gonna go through the cuts one more time as just a, a brief review on what we pulled out of the carcass. Uh, again, a relatively lean carcass, um, a carcass that was above average in terms of muscle. 
and so we don't expect a tremendous amount of waste. If you have a lighter muscle carcass or a carcass that has a higher percentage of fat, there's going to be more waste to this carcass. As we go through the cuts on the uh, shoulder region, we've got the Boston butt, which is the top portion. And again, remember, we pulled the blade stakes off of the Boston butt. And again, stakes out of the front region of that carcass. We've got the picnic shoulder, which has a portion of that uh, skin left on it to uh, protect the carcass or this cut through the cooking process. Again, a cut that uh, could be used in a slow food uh, type application. We've got the jowl and then also the neck bones, which uh, again, the neck bones, if you want to make some type of a pork stock, would be a real good option to be able to cook in uh, liquid with other uh, um, accompaniments like vegetables and spices and seasoning and that type of thing. Uh, we move to the, uh, the pork loin, which again was that long section that included the rib all the way up to the sirloin region. We broke that down into an eight rib roast, which includes uh, uh, the uh, eight ribs uh, in that four section. Um, we also included, or we have five rib chops. We have five T-bone or center cut loin chops. We have four, or excuse me, three T-bone. We have four um, porterhouse chops, again from the center cut loin. And then we have two boneless uh, sirloin cutlets that are left over at the tail end of that loin where it attaches to the uh, fresh pork leg. Just below that, we have the fresh belly region. And again, out of the belly, we pulled the uh, spare ribs out. Um, and uh, those, again, are, are a real good option in terms of a retail cut. The belly, of course, like the ham or the fresh leg, will go on to be cured and uh, will produce bacon with this portion. Again, making sure that we had at least a half an inch of fat in that pocket region. And then the ham, of course, uh, the largest component or single component, uh, potentially a retail cut as is, or could be broken down into smaller units. But the ham uh, um, would go on for further curing and smoking in order to uh, um, uh, meet consumer demand. So again, the number of cuts that we have across the table and uh, from this lean, heavy muscle pork carcass. And uh, we have about 15 pounds of uh, waste here. Um, and this again came from a 188 pound carcass. Uh, again, if you recall, we did one half of the carcass. We trimmed to a quarter inch retail trim, so it's retail ready product. And we have some larger items in this carcass breakdown with roasts. Um, but again, 15 pounds of waste off of about uh, 94 pounds of uh, total weight of the half of the carcass, 188 pounds of the total weight of the carcass. Now that we've completed the breakdown of uh, carcass number one, um, we took the liberty to go ahead and break down carcass number two and then carcass number three as well. And we've got a series of uh, chops from the center cut loin uh, to be able to show you uh, differences and comparisons. If you remember that uh, poor carcass number one uh, had the largest loin eye when we measured it in the carcass form at the 10th rib, that seems to uh, transcend throughout the chops here. Of course, they're nicely, uh, nicely shaped, uh, certainly a tremendous amount of uh, product there. And uh, again, that was a relatively lean carcass, so limited uh, amount of trim. We look at carcass number two, very similar in terms of the shape of the loin eye, particularly lingismus dorsi, uh, certainly a nice oval shape to it. We appreciate that. It was the second largest in terms of loin eye, I think around six and a half uh, inches. Uh, again, we've got the data uh, for you or the exact data for you um, on the video. And then carcass number three, again, a smaller eye and a tremendous amount of fat. But the one thing that we noted on carcass number three was the potential for an increase in quality. And that quality reads to a little bit darker color for us. It also shows that we have um, uh, possibly a, a notch more marbling uh, with regard to the amount of intramuscular fat that was deposited. And those two things are actually going to give the consumer a more pleasurable experience. 
Now, having said that, there isn't as much yield on that carcass, because if you remember, those loin, the loin eye was relatively small and a tremendous amount of fat. And so if your idea is to push product that is high quality, high marbling, um, with a lower yield, then that's possible. Uh, you know, that, that would be something that you'd command a higher price for in some of the restaurant and uh, um, institutional trade, particularly from a niche marketing standpoint, uh, that's a big push. If you're looking at trying to increase uh, and have efficient hogs with a tremendous amount of muscle and a tremendous amount of leanness, again, our exhibition or show hog here in the center of the, of the lineup, and then our commercial hog here at the top of the lineup. A hanging pork carcass will typically yield about 140 to 175 pounds of meat to take home. However, if you have more cuts made into boneless products, or more grind done for sausage or cured smoked products, the hanging carcass will yield about 125 to 165 pounds of take-home meat. Basically, the more fat that is trimmed, the more bone taken out of the meat cuts, or pork cuts that are cured or smoked, will yield less take-home product. You will want to consider your family's cooking and eating preferences when choosing cuts and package sizes. A skilled butcher will be able to assist you in deciding what meat cuts are available from specific portions of the carcass, and what further processing, such as curing or sausage, is available to increase your eating experience and may also result in less preparation time. Pork. It's what can be for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, um, Paul, if you want to take yourself off a of mute right quick, um, is there any questions that you want to go over? Uh, well, I answered, uh, I answered most of the questions inside the, uh, uh, the question answer area. Um, and, and some of them were pretty detailed questions. I guess, you know, I, there were questions about, uh, uh, uncured products versus cured products. And I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, I don't know what the answer to that is. I know the, the uh, FDA, uh, which is responsible for uh, food labeling and uh, USDA have been pressured into uh, um, trying to make some alterations. I think that regulation is, is tentatively scheduled for May of 21. So that should be coming up here in the next uh, few months. So there may be a delay on that based off of the whole COVID thing, because I think some of that information when they said they would have an answer or a, a workup um, was uh, in 2019. So I'd be, uh, you know, I'm not sure if that'll happen in May or not. Typically you don't know a lot of that information. Sometimes you'll hear public hearing stuff that comes out, um, but I would, I would imagine that it'll probably, once it occurs, it'll come out in the federal register and then uh, have new guidelines. And I, the biggest issue is that a lot of people perceive that uncured products are nitrate free and that's not true. Um, they just have an additive type product that is, that is incorporated that has either nitrate linked to it or is a byproduct or nitrate is a byproduct of that. So in the case of uh, certain bacteria, we use those in fermenting sausages for lactic acid starter culture to actually get um, the acidic effect. Uh, they also have bacteria that the byproduct through the waste management highway is production of, of nitrates, nitrites. And so they use that and they consider that to be an uncured product. But the only way that you get a pink 
color on the lean is the presence of nitrite and its reaction with the muscle tissue or the, uh, the hemoglobin, I should say, it changes the color of that product and fixes the color and preserves it. So anything that's uncured is not necessarily nitrate free. And I think that's where the, dish, the, the, the question and the concern comes from the industry is that are we selling the, you know, are consumers being told the truthful thing? It's kind of that, and it kind of leads into the whole discussion about, um, you know, some of our competing vegetable protein items that are on the shelf. Why are they labeling everything as a meat product, even though it's a vegetable based product? And so there's, there's that issue that's kind of come up through this whole process. Are we really being upfront with our consumers? And so um, I think you guys are going to see some labeling uh, things come down the pipeline, but uh, I, I did hopefully my answer, I was able to, uh, um, to kind of give you some ideas. Celery salt would be another way to incorporate nitrate. Uh, certain sea salts have a high concentration of nitrate. The, the problem with using those, what they call natural sources, which, you know, basically they're, they're attached sources. They're not a purified nitrate because nitrate's natural anyways. Um, but you add those in in a natural or in that, uh, that linked form, you don't have as much consistency. So from the commercial standpoint, um, you get a lot more inconsistent product and consumers don't like that. You know, every time they go buy a package of hot dogs, they want the same experience every time or a package of ham, they want the same experience. And anytime you add or change that experience, um, you know, you have the potential of losing customers. And so that, that does become a problem with, with uh, what's labeled now as the uncured products. Thanks, Paul, thanks. Um, I see there's a few more questions popping up and I'll let you take those on, Paul. We're getting up on our hour and I, I wanna wrap up a few things. I know we always hang on a little bit afterwards and you guys can uh, make uh, ask uh, Paul questions. Uh, I'll uh, turn on the mics. But before I do that, I wanna uh, do a few things, remind you guys that this, you, this video is available on um, our Connors WSU YouTube channel and I will send you that link. Um, you will also be receiving a survey at the end of this program, and you'll also receive an email tomorrow to remind you. And I will tell you, um, we spent a lot of time going over the material or the information that we got in that first survey. Not only did it help us kind of guide how we can do better and put this program together for you, but it really showed us the diversity that we have in people um, attending and helped us identify topics. And so with that, I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Samuel from South Dakota State University introduce what our March 12th topic will be. Very good, so on March 12th, we'll be in the barn. So Dr. Toller is gonna be on site uh, looking at selection of show pigs. And we'll have one of our producers talk through some of the management ideals there for that success. Uh, so again, selecting show pigs and management for success. Thank you, Dr. Samuels. So as you can see, we have a variety of people on everything from show pigs to um, most of you guys are direct marketers also of meat. So we're really trying to make sure that we answer all your questions. I know some of the topics might not be as relevant to you, but hopefully you'll learn something at, at all of those. And we will be running the second Friday of every month from two to three Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we are, have picked up a few other states that are attending. Most of you guys are from Washington State, but we have some Oregon and Idaho and Alaska joined us. And I think we have a California or so. So um, we, we welcome you guys to participate um, in, in those things. Dr. Toller, Dr. Samuels, Ernie, um, or Jamie, is there anything else that I forgot to mention about our, our series that I should... Um, I should say. I think you're good, Sarah, thanks. Good deal. I'm trying to figure out how I turned on the audio last time. Do you remember, Jamie? For, for participants or panelists? Oh. For participants. Um, I think you have to, yeah, in, no, invite them. No, that's not right. So, while, you're, while you're doing that, Sarah, there, there was one question that popped up I answered real quick. 
And I think it was in regards to, uh, you know, how do you make determination in terms of uh, the number of cuts or, you know, ribs versus chops and that kind of stuff. And, and really a lot of that's going to be, uh, be based on your customer base. Um, you also work with a processor and the processor is probably going to have a standard fabrication. And what I, what I would, I'd like to be able to put out there is that anytime you ask that processor to do above and beyond what they tend to do on average, there should be some additional charges. I mean, you as a producer should expect to pay more because you're asking that processor to make more cuts. And I think what I hear a lot of times from producers and, you know, and I came up through livestock production and all that, and I understand it. It's like, you always try to get everything as cheap as possible. But if you're doing things that are direct marketing, you should command a higher price. And if you're doing something that fits into a niche market, you should command a higher price. You should also expect your processor, if you're asking them to do more things, to command a higher price. It's, it's kind of an equal thing across the board. So we, not, we need to get into that. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I can't compete with, you know, I'm, I'm talking to them and they're at uh, the farmer's market. They're like, it's really hard to compete with the grocery store. Well, you shouldn't. You're, you're a different you're a different beast. So be confident in your product and market it that way and tell the story and command a higher price, but expect anything that you ask that processor to do, they should command a higher price as well. We gotta keep everybody in business. And uh, there, there are certain expectations I think we need to, to, to get out of our traditional phase, particularly if you're doing something that fits into that niche piece. Hey Paul, Bill had uh, raised his it's hand. Bill, do you have a question? If anybody has a question that I haven't, uh, that it wants to ask it out loud, just raise your hand and I will, uh, I will bring you on. There's uh, there's one that came into the box. It, what is the best heritage breed crosses for faster maturity and great marbling slash flavor. Do you want to tackle that, Ryan, or one of the other panelists? I always say there's as much variation within a breed as, as between a breed. I think it's selecting good yeah. genetics and good feed. Um, I don't think, I mean, we do know that certain breeds marble better, but I don't think that just selecting one breed is the, the best. Um, you have to manage for that too. Yeah, and I think my experience is on the large blacks. I mean, they're pretty big frame, long bodied animals are pretty big outline. Um, you know, for, for a heritage type breed, they tend to be on the bigger frame side. Um, you, you know, you, I've heard people talking about Cooney Coonies. You're not gonna have a real fast growing, you know, fast maturing type animal uh, with one of those. Um, so I, I guess it really depends on the breed aspect of it. John had a question. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you guys for doing this. This is really, uh, this is really informative. And I, and I asked, this is probably a little, little off subject a little bit, but um, here in Oregon, Central Oregon, and I believe throughout the country, uh, there's been a real backlog uh, for at the custom, custom processor shops. Do you have any insight to that? I mean, is that an anomaly? Um, or I guess, is that, is that even occurring widespread? It feels like it is. Uh, is that an anomaly? Is that going to level itself out? Is there, do you have any thoughts or insight about, about that situation? Well, I, I think that's something we're seeing all over the place. I mean, it's, you know, I, we've got issues here in Washington state as well. There's, there's many states that don't have integrated state inspection. And, um, you know, I'm not saying or advocating that a state should jump back into state inspection. I mean, Washington, we had it here back in the seventies and, and uh, there's been some, you know, rumbling about that. Um, the reality of it is, is that state inspection and federal inspection have to be the same. And they give you the same output or the same benefit that you can sell individual products, you know, providing that your local health district allows you to do that. There's also constraints there. Um, I, I think, you know, I think on the small processor side, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of those, um, not going on to the next generation. You know, people are getting older, they're aging out of those operations and there's nobody that wants to take them over. 
And so it's kind of a lost art from that perspective. Um, I think that there's a push to change some of that, um, but you know, I'm not sure how long that's going to take. I know we've been talking about you know, ways that we can teach and educate more processors or small processors here in the state of Washington. When you've got a small facility and you've got people that want to learn or they have the potential to learn to give their producers what they want, but there are only three people at that unit, you can't expect them to leave the unit to come all the way to Washington State University to learn. So we're, we're looking at maybe some opportunities on a mobile basis to actually go to them to do some training and to educate. But I think the bigger issue is that um, sustainability piece, you know, trying to, to, to figure out who's going to take over those operations, who's going to continue those operations, and then how can we support them from going, you know, from being a custom harvest to maybe possibly jumping over to a small USDA facility so that we can give producers the opportunity to sell direct on a piece by piece basis versus a, a portion by portion of animal basis. Thanks, Paul. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I just want to add a lot of you uh, last two weeks ago asked about processing and more detailed um, processing all the way from injection sites to castration. And that video is being developed. It'll probably be one after the, the, the show pig one. So just so you know, we did hear that. And if we get a fact sheet before that done up on a little detail, we'll get it to you. Hey, Sarah, there's another question here. It says, any, any consistency or guidance around impact of grazing slash forage on taste and palatability, um, time for feed stocks uh, to impart flavor generally? There's, you know, th there's a lot of research out there. You've got to like hunt and peck. Um, you know, there's certainly, uh, I've had some really grass fed or, or really great forage fed products. Um, I've had some really, really bad ones. So, and some of those may be the type of forage, um, you know, the environment that that forage was raised in. Um, some of them may be the type of breed on that application. So you got to be pretty diligent. It's hard to answer that question without knowing the breeds and knowing the environment and the forages and, you know, um, you know, I had some really great beef down in southern Idaho a summer ago. Uh, they were actually feeding in forage situation, 100% forage on all their calves, no grain supplement at all. But the forage was a mix of grasses and lagoons, and so the cattle had choice. And, um, you know, some of those calves are probably going to go towards one type of species, grass species. Maybe some of them really do well in terms of having a multitude of, uh, of a mix there. And so it's, it's a real hard question to answer. On the pork side, I, you know, maybe one of you guys have a better answer for that. But again, I think it just depends on the, the environment. And I, the, uh, Paul, I'll jump some stuff in there. I think for the most part, we're talking about total calories. So those animals need to can, are going to need to consume so many calories to have a, a good growing and eating experience. So if you have good grasses, you're going to get there quicker than poor grasses. The other thing I'll caution you on with hogs and chickens, because they are monogastrics. Um, watch what kind of fats you're feeding to your animals. If you're feeding a lot of camelina or fish meal, anything like that, all of a sudden you're going to have pork or eggs that smell and taste like fish because the fatty acid composition of the oil that you were feeding to those animals matches fish more closely than some of the vegetable fats that we're used to. So some different things to watch out there if you're also doing some, um, different ingredient feedings versus the more traditional grains that we feed. Thank you, Jamie. That was a good, good, good reminder on, on the calories. Um, we see that a lot that we, we don't pay enough attention to that. Hey, Paul, I have a question in the chat. Um, why don't more small producers take advantage of the FSIS, Food Safety Inspection Service System certification? Do you know exactly what, I don't know exactly what Bradley's talking about there, because that would be part of the USDA. Yeah, I'm not sure. Are, are you talking about further processing? Maybe that's what he's talking about. Brad, are you on to ask that question? Yes, yeah, for processing. Okay. For further um, processing. 
Well, I, th I think traditionally a lot of those operations have always, I mean, you still have to get the product from someplace. And, you know, so that's, that might be some of the holdup there. Um, you know, and I know, you know, we're, we're kind of running shy in terms of getting enough of those small groups of animals harvested within the state of Washington. Um, and I know other states run into that issue as well. And so you've got to have that product to be able to do that. You know, the guidelines and the expectations are, ba are, are basically the same, regardless of whether you're running a further processing facility where you're taking in USDA inspected product and then further processing that, um, you know, whether or, or whether you had a, a, a harvest through a retail cut distribution. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think it might be a situation by situation and what people want to put up with. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point because you still have to have them USDA and uh, harvested uh, to go ahead and process them into that that system. And um, I think some, you know, when I looked at our survey, there are some people that uh, really want to go all the way the, into consumers, and there are some that are very content in uh, raising those animals and selling them at either a contract, a feeder, or as a show pig. So is there any other questions? Yeah, there's, um, so on the color scale and quality, the darker the color, the better. Is this an aesthetic issue or a different reason? Um, so typically um, it, it, it's, it's for a different reason. So when we start to look at uh, uh, quality of product and uh, that darker scale tends to be um, uh, potentially a little bit higher in terms of water holding capacity. And so we look at certain breeds and they have a better ability to be able to do that. So that's gonna increase some of your juiciness and then have a positive impact in terms of tenderness. Um, even though tenderness is strictly a protein-protein interaction, the more space that you can create between those proteins by increasing the water holding capacity, the more tender the product's gonna be. And um, so we tend to look at some of the heritage breeds I think that they have a little bit better water holding capacity. I think they have a notch higher degree of marbling. So you add those two things together, you've got a little more palatability and you've got a little bit more uh, in terms of that increased tenderness and juiciness aspect of it. And so that's, that, that's one of the reasons that some people are willing to put up with less yield from those hogs, um, you know, is, is from that standpoint in particular, uh, and, you know, one of the reasons that we ran into some quality issues a few years back and we started, you, you'll see hogs that have brine injection in the retail case still, and that's to kind of guard against the fact that that product may dry out or may be tougher because you've expressed a lot of moisture. So cooking loss is going to be about a 30% moisture loss right off, you know, right off the bat. So if you have any additional moisture loss that occurs prior to that, that's going to actually, um, it, you know, accentuate that that effect. Thanks, Paul. So we're coming up on 15 minutes after. One of the things that I'm going to do for everybody that's registered, I will send a copy of the email addresses so you can follow up and ask more questions later on. But I want to go ahead and and um, excuse anybody that wants to go ahead and leave. If, you, if Paul wants to stay on and answer some more questions, I'm more than happy to do that. But I will wrap up the uh, the seminar as we have it today. So um, I appreciate all you guys participating and um, be sure to fill out those surveys. There's some um, questions specifically on butchering and marketing. And if there's anything we can do to help uh, answer some of those questions, I can tell you from WSU standpoint, we've been working with WSDA, um, trying to help with this bottleneck of getting animals harvested in a timely fashion. And and trying to bring on new um, packing plants, but it's not an easy overnight uh, solution. Uh, so with that, I will um, wrap it up, but if anybody has questions, just feel free to ask them to Paul and I'll let it stay on until we finish up. Uh, hey, Paul, can you hear me? I got a question. Yeah, yeah, Bill. Okay, so uh, I we butcher a few hogs for people and uh, they're always asking me, some of the people are asking me to hang them a certain amount of time. Yeah. And I, I just want to know what your opinion is. What's the maximum number of days that you should leave a hog hanging before it starts getting a rancid taste to it? 
Well, I you don't need to leave hogs very long. Hey. Um, they're they're the quickest in terms of uh, uh, you know the hooked or cloven hoof species that uh, actually um, in terms of uh, um, tenderness application. So you're you're looking at uh, you know within two to three days, you're probably in an acceptable level of tenderness. Um, any, any longer than that, you're going to run the risk of, you know, having some off flavors. So pork fat is a little bit different than beef fat and lamb fat, and it's by far the most palatable, but part of that is because it's got a different fatty acid profile. And Jamie probably could even jump on this. Be, I mean, this is what she did a lot of her master's work in, but, uh, um, you know, certainly in terms of that fat piece, you don't want it to go rancid and and uh, there's no point in hanging them much longer than that. You know, cat, cattle, we, we recommend, you know, ideally to age them for 14 days. But again, you don't have to hang them for that period of time. You could actually break the carcasses down, which is going to protect them once you get them into cryovac bag and then age those cuts within the cryovac bag. That's going to minimize moisture loss and it's going to minimize oxidation of fats. And so you're not going to have the rancidity. And so if you really wanted to leave them, you know, plus you're going to actually maximize cube space versus having a carcass hang in a cooler. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of that. I was uh, working in the commercial lamb industry, and that's how we shipped a lot of lamb carcasses over from Australia back to the United States when I was living over there. Um, you know, we tried to maximize that cube and we'd put things into a square box and then put it into a, a refrigerated container and ship it over. And that was... Uh, you know, there, there's no reason. I mean, those lambs were still refrigerated. They were still aging, um, but they weren't hanging. So we weren't losing the moisture loss. We weren't losing. I mean, you lose a lot of that stuff, even on a beef carcass, a lamb carcass. So there's, and, and really for pork, pork is two to three days aging time max that you need for tenderness. Lamb, you're probably in the five to seven day range. Beef, um, you know, at minimum 14 days, ideally 21 but that doesn't have to be aging on the rail. That, that okay. me personally, let's get it into a box, cry back it and protect the moisture loss because otherwise we're losing money. Okay, so I guess my question, uh, the main question was what's the maximum amount of time you wanna go before it starts becoming possibly rancid? Well, it depends on your environment. I, I, don't, I don't know what kind of a cooler we're talking about. Um, well, thirty. I, I, probably, I probably wouldn't go any longer than seven. Okay, that's that's what we've been sticking with. It's my cooler is thirty four degrees all the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, it's 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 the the temperature. It's the um, you know, is it an older cooler versus a newer newer cooler? Are there are there things in that environment that are going to cause rancidity? There's a lot of things that could go that could play into that. I mean, if it was a brand new cooler, everything was sealed. There was there was no any anything in that environment because it was you know pretty clean. Um, you could probably even go longer than seven days. But I I mean, there's really no need to do that. So okay, well I'm I'm gonna stick with my seven day deal. deal. <laughs> Have you had any complaints? Okay. Oh no. Okay, well then we, you're probably good. We, <laughs> we don't do too many. We do a couple hundred pigs a year. That's about it. Okay. All right. Well, then you're probably good, Bill. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Yeah, I have one if you guys don't mind. Yep. Um, Kim. My, yeah, my name is Kim. I'm actually one of the Whitman County 4-H leaders here um, in Pullman. And I grew up showing hogs selling hogs here at the local fair. I probably had over about 60 head myself. And my siblings and I, we always fed Perina, the, the starter, grower, finisher. And we just went with that and exercised our hogs and we never had a problem. Now I'm at the stage where I am with being a leader. My older daughter is actually got her first set, set of show hogs. And I've noticed that the industry might have changed a little bit. I know a lot of people are now buying all these different containers of protein additives and what have you and mixing and matching stuff. And I don't plan on doing that. Um, I think with the starter and the gorgeous hogs we actually got are doing really well on starter. So my question to you guys with the marbling and the coloring and things like that, how do you feel about the proteins that people are now adding to feed? 
Well, I, I can touch a little bit on that. Um, I, I will say, you know, there's lots of feed companies that are coming out with additives and, and they are very well researched and founded. The thing that we gotta remember with show pigs, instead of going to an ideal weight, we're going to a date. And so sometimes we have to get into a holding pattern or sometimes we have pigs that aren't growing as well. And yeah, we got to push them. rather see kids use those uh, products that have been specifically formulated to do that than mm -hmm. the homemade milkshakes that I sometimes see happening with calf milk or adding oil or things such as that, which can cause a huge, um, you know, digestive upset, some health things such mm -hmm. as that. So, um, you know, I'm not saying buy any one of them, but just remember you want it, like Jamie said, a good balanced feed. But when we're going to a date and we have show animals, some of them might not be grown as fast. I'd rather see you turn to one of those proven products by one of our companies that's done the research and some of the, the hocus pocus stuff I see um, on social media or hearing, you know, people talk about, I've heard people say eggs and all sorts of things. And I'd rather see you use uh, one of those. Hmm. Well, well, I've just, I've just seen um, a lot of kids nowadays, they're actually buying those additives from the get go. And I mean, cause I've had to push hogs, I've had to hold hogs, but I've never seen it to where people use them as like a daily, additive for their food mm -hmm. and I've seen some hogs go down and it, I can't help but wonder if maybe pushing too much protein is damaging their joints and causing upset there. Well there are different additives and I think one of the things that I've seen is people don't understand what those buckets are not all created the same. Some mm -hmm. of them will have a paleen in it. It needs to be fed exactly according to label. Um, you know the protein ones sometimes people think a little is good and so they add a lot is more and so you definitely need to follow the label as it as it slates on there. I do do show lambs and I will tell you, um, we can make really good lambs with genetics, but if we want the extra pop, sometimes having those additives um, has, has made that, we, we can, I, I can feel and see the difference in our lambs when we put some of that on there. Uh, so I would add, uh, Kim, if you're, if you're not comfortable using supplements, stick to a really good balanced diet front to end. And mm -hmm. if you do have show pigs, the ones that are bred to have more muscle expression, they do need a little more protein, but we're talking about, you know, a 10th or maybe, a, you know, two tenths more lysine, um, in their total mm -hmm. diets. If you're not okay. comfortable, don't do it. Um, as well, we just get as your kids are older and have done more stuff and that kind of stuff, you might look at it, but unfortunately not everyone's following the rules. Um, if you have pigs that you're taking to a single show, it's a whole different situation than like we're seeing some pigs that have actually been shown at a market weight for two or three months and then coming yeah. to finally coming to a terminal show. And that's a totally different deal than, you know, if you bought pigs, you're taking them to Spokane Junior Livestock Show and that's the yep. only place they're going. That's a totally different scenario than, you know what? These that jackpots, been at, yeah. That been at 280 for two and a half months. So yeah. um, you can't go wrong with a good balanced program. Um, and if you're concerned, you can always stick with a grower all the way mm. through because that's going to bump your protein and lysine a little bit without doing all the other supplements and potentially having other issues. But the extra protein when they are adding them in there, is it upsetting the marbling and the meat? Um, no, it's more it's and more and more likely or not. If you do have an extra protein problem, you're going to show it in joints and um, reproduction, which okay. if you have pigs that are terminal, it doesn't matter on the reproduction side. Or if That's you've fair. got a really high protein feed and it's over what the animal requires, it's just going out the waste management highway and you're paying a whole lot of money and not getting a whole lot of benefit. Yeah. And that doesn't help you gain weight, nothing. That's just no. bad. So I, I echo what Jamie and Sarah said. I, I think they both hit that well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Any other questions? Well, it looks like we have answered all the questions. Ryan, that was a great lead in for what we will get to look at. It looks like the show, everybody's getting ready to get their show pigs. We're hopeful in Washington. We're a little jealous of you guys in, in South Dakota, but 
uh, we're planning to get ready to show again. Our state is opening back up. So um, we're looking forward to that March 12th uh, seminar. Well, good deal. We'll see you guys March 12th. And uh, stay tuned. I'll send you guys information on the links and uh, emails. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.